What's up, kids, folks? Welcome to the number one college football show. I am your host, RJ Young. Thank you for watching on the Fox Sports app. YouTube or listening wherever you get your podcast today. We're going to instantly react to Michigan spring game, which was featured on Big Fox, where we got to see the quarterbacks, got to see some Donovan Edwards, got to see what they have at wide receiver, got to see who they are actually pointing to take over for Mike Sainer still on that defense. A lot to unpack here, but off the rip, big takeaways from Ohio State, uh, excuse me, Ohio State, from Michigan spring practice is, well, frankly, that they didn't turn out the way that I thought they were going to turn out to crown the 15-0 national champion Michigan Wolverines at the big house, the way, say, they did at Ohio State. Now, I don't know the reported attendance figure. I'm sure that's going to come around by the time you see this, but I do know 80,000 people showed up to the sh uh, shoe to see Ohio State and its spring game. I would be shocked if more than 80,000 people were in attendance at the big house based on what we saw in the stands, what we saw on social online. And I got to point this out because Ohio State was – selling tickets to the spring game for $10 a head with packages going for as high as 37 bucks for a glorified practice. Admission to the big house for Michigan spring game was free. Feels like a letdown for me. Now, this also kind of goes back and forth with what Michigan values and what it doesn't. Hey, RJ, it's spring. There are other things to do. It's cold outside. It was nice at Ohio State. We shouldn't compare the two. Well, we're going to compare the two because it's Ohio State and Michigan. That's how this works. That's always going to be how this works. Michigan is always going to be compared to Ohio State, and Ohio State is always going to be compared to Michigan. That said, I think at quarterback, they're pretty good, right? I think they're pretty good. I think Alex Orgy is going to be the dude. I like what they have behind him, right? I like what I saw from Davis Warren and uh, the Jaden exponents, right? That of Jaden Davis and Jaden Denagel. I don't think they need to go into the portal to go get a quarterback. I, I think they, they're fine with what they have, but I also wasn't wowed by any particular play. I was wowed by traits. Like, all of those guys can sling it. All those guys have pretty good footwork, and it's very clear that they looked the part. Now, the phrase that has been talked about with this particular offense and that program in general is nothing has changed and everything has changed, right? Nothing has changed in the form of the system, the way that they're going to run the offense, the kind of players that they know they're going to have, the guys that are returning, what has changed the offensive side of that ball is kind of had a level up, right? Sharon Moore becomes a head coach. Kurt Campbell goes from quarterback's coach to offensive coordinator and quarterback's coach. You get to see that guys like Roman Wilson are gone, but on the outside, they look a lot like Andy Reid's Kansas City Chiefs to me. They're very fast and very short on the outside, right? They got Tyler Morris. They got Fred Moore. They got Samaj Morgan out there making plays on checkdowns and whatnot, which is what you want, but there's not a big body receiver out there for Alex Orgy to throw the ball to. Those big bodies are inside with Colston Loveland. They think a lot of Klein. We'll see what the tight ends actually do because that offensive line is going to carry a lot of the weight because, well, they got seven in the backfield, and this is seven's year, right? Donovan Edwards is the guy. He has wanted to be RB1 for the last couple of years. Blake Corum, being who he is, is kind of forced to be RB2. Now that he has the keys to the offense because it's going to run through the run game, very excited to see what he's capable of. It also gave me an opportunity to really get into, I thought, an interesting aspect of the offense. And the reason I think it's an interesting aspect of the offense because, well, it's another Ohio State tie. Tony Alford joined the offense for Michigan in, I mean, just a month ago. And that was that was huge. That was a big news, right? Because uh, Tony Alford had been at Ohio State for almost a decade. And when he decided to take another job, that's one thing. Taking another job at Michigan? It's kind of jarring. And then I got to see the first full-length photos or video, I should say, courtesy of uh, my buddy Mike, Michael Cohen, who wrote about uh, the Michigan Spring Game. Check that out on FoxSports.com. In all blue, and it was just it's just jarring, right? Tony's a great guy. I really enjoy Tony. I also understand how Ohio State fans are listening or watching and going, feel some kind of way about that. I know you do. But the thing that struck me was how excited Donovan Edwards was to have Tony Alford as his running backs coach. Remember, Donovan Edwards had one of the great running backs in Michigan history as his running backs coach just last year, right? So you get a Tony Alford in there, and what does he say about him, uh, except that he, it's amazing for him because he always wanted Tony to coach him at some level, really enjoyed the recruiting process with him, really enjoyed getting to know him and almost went to Ohio State based entirely on Tony Alford, ends up going to Michigan, and now Tony Alford ends up joining Donovan Edwards. We know what it's going to look behind him with Khalil Mullings and then We'll find out what that third back is going to do. But Donovan Edwards is in the catbird seat to really 
take this offense in the direction that he wants it to go, which is probably going to look a lot like what Blake Corn was doing in 2022 and 2023, trying to run the table once again. Back to some game notes really quick. Another thing I was looking for, and I made sure to check in with my guy Mike on this, is Michigan has helmet-to-headset technology for their spring game, which is funny because Michigan got pinched for an elaborate sign-stealing scheme because we didn't have helmet to headset technology in 2023. The Big Ten, for its part, tried to get this done over the summer before all this happened, and it just didn't get done. And then it came to a head because Connor Stallions was found to have orchestrated a three-year campaign to steal signs in several different uh, stadiums and several different programs, right? All of it's a bad look. Jim Harbaugh gets reprimanded for the recruiting violations. Jerome Moore, too. They have to miss games. Jim Harbaugh also is forced to sit out games late in the season because of this Sign stealing scandal it doesn't matter. They run the table. They go fifteen and zero, right? It's also curious to me that we're talking about this team and helmet to headset technology. And I don't really think it matters for them because they're an old school offense, old school defense. They want to run the ball, want to control the clock, they want to play stand up defense and try to keep the scoring down. I'm curious to find out though. After we get past the quarterbacks, after we get past the wide receivers, after we get past the running backs, what do we have on defense, right? Turns out they got a lot on defense that returns, particularly on that defensive line. Uh, it's a great note by my guy, Jake Butt, who pointed out that the guys that were on that defensive line that made that fourth down stop to win the college football playoff semifinal Rose Bowl against Alabama are all back in the starters on that defensive line, right? We're talking about guys like Kenneth Grant, Mason Graham, Derek Moore, and Josiah Stewart, right? They're all back. But behind them, the depth, that's what's going to really make the difference for Wink Martindale in his first year as head, uh, head coach, as a uh, defensive coordinator at Michigan. I think they're going to be fine. I think Zeke Berry has the tools to do what Mike Sainer still was doing for them last year, where he is an everything defensive back. He can blitz, he can cover, he can play some weak side linebacker if that's the scheme you're going to be in. Third most interceptions in all of college football last year. That's big shoes to fill. But you also got Will Johnson back, who is a 2023 first-team All-American playing corner. You can stick him out there on an island. You're going to lose Rod Moore for the season, but you're going to be fine at safety, right? I think everything about this team is okay. But the thing that I would stress to you is they are going to play a game against Texas on Big Noon. That's September 7th. This Michigan football team doesn't look good enough to beat that Texas team. Now, it's spring. That can change. But what I saw offensively and defensively, I don't believe in right now. Now, it's going to reflect in the rankings that I think that Texas and Michigan are both very good. But if you're talking about the Texas team that I saw in the college football playoff plan against Washington, the Texas team that I saw beat Alabama, the Texas team that I saw win a big 12, big 12 title, it's a good Texas team that returns a bunch, right? That's going to be one of the better offensive lines in all of football, facing one of the better defensive lines in all of football. Texas's offensive line is really good. Michigan's defensive line is very good. That game's in Ann Arbor, but again, it's in September where the weather's not really going to be that much of a factor. And I really like Quinn Ewers in this draft-eligible year for himself. I love what they have on that offense and that defense. I get to see Pete Kwiatkowski going up against Kurt Campbell. I get to see Steve Sarkeesian going up against Wing Martindale. We know that Sark is going to come out with some gadgets, some trickery, some some passes, uh, pass plays that we're probably not ready to see just yet. But I think that this Michigan team can get to a point where it feels like the kind of team that can beat Texas. They just didn't look as sharp as I would like them to look. But again, talking about a game in April, it's not really a game. We're talking about it being a practice. They got some work to do. Sharon Moore's got some work to do. He's kind of quiet about what it is they're doing, but you can see they got all the pieces that they need to get off to a good start, and they're going to have to because unlike the previous years, their non-conference schedule is kind of loaded. However, we got a 12-team playoff, right? So do they want to run the table once again? Absolutely. Is that in the cards? It's difficult because you got a loaded Big Ten. you got a loaded non-conference schedule. Can you get to the playoff in 12-team Setting, yes, you could probably get three losses if those losses are to Ohio State, ranked Oregon, ranked Penn State for just giggles, or ranked Texas, right? You're probably going to do that. But I think that we're going to see whether or not they have the depth to do this probably by October. And that's what this season is going to be about as a huge talking point. Who has the fellas 
down the depth chart to rotate in and make plays for you as we're going to see players play more snaps and we're going to see games kind of sort of have more meaning and not at the same time. And what I mean by that is they're going to have more meaning because everybody's going to have more of an opportunity to get into the playoff late in the season. But they're not going to have that much meaning if you are, say, 9-0 and and you have signature wins going into November. Maybe you start to think about, okay, what would it look like if we were on the road for a playoff game in a 12-team playoff as opposed to being able to host one? How much do we want to throw at this? When do we get to see guys? Might end up looking a lot like what the NFL used to do. So it still kind of does. Late in the season when you know that you have your playoff bid not only locked up, but you can't make it better or worse. You go out there and you throw the twos to see what they got, get them some experience. And I think that's a very smart way to look at this. And that's something Sharon Moore had done with his quarterbacks, right? J.J. McCarthy playing in the Rose Bowl, excuse me, Rose Bowl, Peach Bowl against Georgia, and then or Orange Bowl against Georgia, my bad. Rose Bowl, he had Alex Orgy come in against Bama. So they got pieces. It's April. Do they look good enough to win a national championship? Not right now, but again, it doesn't matter right now because it's April. I am going to be paying attention to the transfer portal like you. Try to see who gets smarter, who gets stronger at some key positions. But right now, if you're Michigan, hold your water. Continue to build toward this season. And let's see what you got. Okay, that's going to do it for this instant reaction to Michigan spring game. Uh, be back here on Monday as we have a very special episode with Bomani Jones where we talk about Texas. We talk about Texas A&M. We talk about the SEC. We talk about the Big Ten. We talk about all things college football. I enjoyed this. Bomani enjoyed this. We hope that you enjoy this. Please give us your time. Be here on the YouTube channel and on the uh, on the podcast at 10 a.m. Central Time. That is 11, p 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time because time zone. All right, that's going to do it for me. Deuces. If you like what you've seen, consider subscribing to the number one college football show on YouTube, the Fox Sports app, or wherever you get your podcast.